of what Collector Circle is, so that we all know <laughs> what we're talking about. Um, so one, the museum had, and I can't remember the exact amount of years, but we have been doing Collector Circle for 28 or 20 something years. And it was uh, introduced to the museum by uh, Leslie Bowman, I think, who was a former uh, director of the museum who came from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and she fashioned it after a program they did there. So the way that it works is, um, Let's pretend all of you are people that are coming to this event. You will pay a, a, like a membership fee, I think they're doing now, so basically it's like a ticket price to come to an event. And all of your ticket money goes into a big pot. And you will come here and have a really nice dinner and Adam and I will present eight works of art to you that we have already uh, vetted through the collections committee and through our list of things that we want to have come into the collection. And they're so, available. And they're available. We bring them all into the building so that we're sitting here in this room last night uh, looking at all of the art. Adam and I present all of the art and then you, we've, get, we've presented you more art than we can afford with that pot of money. So, you get to all vote. What is your favorite piece? And then we tally up the votes and the cost of that piece is taken from the big pot of money and say, and then we go, great, we collected that piece first. Really fun. Now we have this amount left and then you all vote again. And we get a second piece of art and we have un less money. And then we keep voting and voting until we run out of money and we don't get all the art, but you get to pick what art comes into the collection. Yes. If I might just put in a minor plug for the development department, which is for next year offering two tickets to Collector's Circle to the volunteer who sells. Well, basically they're doing a lottery. So if you sell a membership, they'll put your name in the hat and then they'll draw from that hat for, so you increase your chances, more Fun. memberships you sell. Fun. So, if you want to participate in the event, there's a... Cool. So, does that make sense to everybody, or do you have a question about it? Okay, so then sometimes, at the end, there might be some people, like Anne, you might be like, I can't believe we didn't collect that one piece that's my favorite one. Then you're going to say, well, I'm going to gather around three of my friends and we're all going to put in money. We're going to collect that ourselves as an additional work to the museum. So sometimes we do get all the works we've presented and sometimes we don't. So, um, and last night was a really fun evening where for the first time ever, um, we we changed it up a little bit, so I'm going to go over here to this wolf over here. We're going to start there and then go around and I'll tell you about all the works and how we, what we collected. So last year at this same event, Collector Circle, a lot of the people that were at the event wanted to have an option of using part of the, that chunk of money to conserve some of the work in the collection. So that what that means is that all of the work that we have in the collection is maybe not in the best condition that it should be in. So sometimes once we get a piece of work, it might take a whole chunk more to make it up to make it safe to be shown to the public and that kind of thing. So this year we added that to the selection. So we added conservation of the work to collector's circle. So this piece we got four years ago in collector's circle. And it's this giant work by Joseph Wolf, which who also did the Gear Falcon attacking the kite that's in uh, Gilcrease. Um, and we got this piece, but it is, uh, the frame is in really bad shape and the painting uh, as you can see, if you guys look a little closer, you can see that there are some weird stretch bar marks, and it's old, so it needs some love. So, that was one of the offerings, and so I'm just going to point, you, we don't have to move. So, this was an offering, we've got this uh, gouache, 
that of that watercolor, the ceramic piece that's a deer, the glass piece, I'll go around afterwards, the uh, oil painting of the moose, the giant, oh, thank you, the elephant mask and the giant bear uh, drawing. So, not we all swim, not that sculpture. So that, thank you for pointing that out. That is a piece that we acquired last year at Collector's Circle, but we only showed a poster of it because it hadn't been cast yet. So we had a cast, it, came, it arrived a month or so ago, and we unveiled it last night to show everyone that this great piece that we acquired last year at Collector's Circle that we are planning to install on the trail, I think, up, up there by the parking lot. And it's by Tim Cherry, who is uh, an artist who's been in the Western Visions for 100 years and has never been in the collection, so it's really important to have him. You guys can, hey, how's it going? Um, so, we were really glad to have Tim Cherry in the collection last year, and now we have that great piece, which is called River Mates. Um, so, we had all of these things uh, around, and um, Adam and I both presented on four different works, and then the voting starts. Um, so, let's see. How should I do this? Shall I tell about all the works and then tell about how the voting went? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, we'll just go around the room. Bronwyn, do you and Adam present on the works that you're passionate about, or is it so, neutral? Mostly, we split it up contemporary and historic, because that is what our expertise right. is. So, Adam presents on the historic works, and I present on the more contemporary works, because that's that's what we do. Right. <laughs> so, um, so, is the wildlife part of this the yeah. concept? Yes. So, you guys might want to come up really close, because this thing is crazy cool. <laughs> So as you're looking at it, I'm going to read some of Adam's notes about it. So this is a woman named Barbara Regina Deitch. And the Deitches were an important family of painters, engravers, and musicians that flourished in Nuremberg during the 18th century. Uh, even at the time of its production, the work of Barbara Regina Deitch was much sought after by collectors in both the Netherlands and England. Employed at the court of Nuremberg, she drew extensi extensively for engravers there. Dietsch's watercolors are often characterized by the use of a black or dark brown, brown ground. This creates a dramatic contrast between the subject and background and emphasizes the sharp, hard finish of the drawing. Various examples of her work can be found in the Broughton Collection at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, England. What separates the work of Barbara Regina from that of her other family members is that the remarkable clarity of depiction and skill in rendering. Um, she overcame contemporary estimations of women's inferiority in the field of art, uh, creating watercolors of distinctive splendor. Uh, so this is from the 1700s. Uh, as I said, she's a female artist, um, and it would fit really well in our European uh, hanging, um, let's see, which has Durer and Paul de Vos. Um, so there's that first piece. Now we'll move over to the Kunert. So I'm going to go through telling you guys all about everyone and then I'll tell you what we collected. So you guys all are pretty familiar with Kunert because we have him uh, in, oh, quite a few pieces in the collection. He trained at the Berlin Academy of Arts, uh, where there was a great interest in wildlife painting, um, and most of the students were uh, encouraged to s study animals at the Berlin Zoo. Um, but around that time, the world opened up to foreign travel, thanks to colonization, and Kuhner became one of the first European artists to safari in East Africa, sketching the wildlife and terrain of the region. He traveled to South and East Africa in 1891, 1905, and 1911, and he toured uh, India and Ceylon in 1906. Uh, he sketched and made field notes, and later executed larger works in his studio. He's a key group of what we call the Big Four, 
uh, European trained artists who took their academic skills out in the field at the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s to create paintings of wildlife that contain a sense of veracity unknown before their time. In addition to Kuhnert, the big four include Richard Frieza, Bruno Lillefors, and Carl Rungus. Uh, they have had a huge impact on wildlife art, influencing Bob Kuhn, Ken Carlson, Tucker Smith, and Robert Bateman. And we have 15 original etchings of his, 19 drawings, and 17 paintings in the collection, and two other gouache watercolors, none of this subject. So there we go. That's not a different piece of paper that I don't have in my hand. <laughs> is, this, is this a watercolor? Okay. Yes. I know, I don't, for some reason I don't have that tombstone information in my hand. Here's on both sides. So uh, Jason Walker uh, is a younger artist. Uh, he was a resident at the Archie Gray Foundation for Ceramic Arts, uh, where he received a fellowship and he got the 2009 NSICA International Residency Fellowship. Um, he has work in major collections such as the Fine Art Museum of San Francisco, De Young, Carnegie Mellon, Arizona State University, uh, Portland Art Museum, uh, and other other places. This piece was just in a big international ceramic exhibit in Korea, um, and he uses the deer because he's interested in it as an animal that is wild, but has also learned to adapt to living among people. It's both wild and common at the same time. He's also interested in the wolf, which is on the back side. It's hard to see. Um, he likes to always include a predator in his work so he can have the dichotomy between the hunted and the hunter. And he says, in my ceramic sculpture, I have been exploring American ideas of nature and how technology has changed our perceptions of it. For quite some time, the inspiration for my imagery has come from day-to-day -day experiences which inform my perceptions more significantly than anything else. I travel to specific American wilderness locations and backpack with my sketchbook to gather imagery because the wildness of the outdoors embodies our most idealistic perception of nature. I also explore the landscapes of technology. Traveling to both large cities and wilderness areas has been an important exploration of the dichotomy of culture and nature. Perhaps through examination we may once again reinstate our own naturalness and one day find balance between the planet and ourselves. Ultimately, in doing so, we may come to a better realization of what it means to be human. Um, what is this piece called? It is called Red Tail, <laughs> and it has a light bulb for a tail that is red. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and yeah, we have two. We have a, a lot of native pots in the collection that are ceramic. We have two Picassos, but we don't have really any contemporary ceramic work. So this would be an interesting addition to the collection. All a million pieces. Okay. Yeah, they were a rapid one. <laughs> but this, I mean, the buildings are ceramic. Yep, they're all porcelain and hand-painted. <coughs> mounted to the brick. They are not. It's all, we had to put it all together. They had all pieces, yes. Alex had to put it together. <laughs> And the cars on top, are they, they're ceramic also, and they and come they off. <laughs> yep. The tail comes off, the legs are separate from the body. Oh, okay. um, the fun part was when we were installing it, all of these kids were really into it, and they all understood it. And one of the things that he says about his work is that it's ceramic illustration. And so the kids all came and said, oh, well, that's about this and about this and about this, because they're used to looking at children's books. All of the adults that I was talking to kept asking me what the meaning of it was, which was very interesting. <laughs> somehow we've lost our visual language. From <laughs> Anyways. How old were the kids? I don't know this big. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> this big. Okay. So these are three works by an artist named William Morris, who is from the Pacific Northwest. He was the chief gaffer for Dale Chihuly for ten years. You guys know who Dale Chihuly is? Um, who was sort of like the father of American glass. Um, and then he went out on his own. So the chief gaffer means he was in charge of everything in Chihuly's workshop. 
So he was like the head glass guy, um, which means he was like managing a whole, you have to have a million people in your glass studio. So he was managing all of these people and helping make all of these really complicated things. Then he went on and had his own glass studio. And he basically has changed the face of American glass by pushing it to a, you know, places that people didn't know that it could go. Um, he's in numerous uh, public collections. He's in the Met, the Corning Museum of Glass, the American Glass Museum, the Hokkaido Museum of Modern Art, and the Victoria and Albert Museum, among others. He gathers much of his inspiration from ancient cultures from around the world. Egyptian, Asian, Native American, uh, all peoples who respected and admired the land they inhabited. His pieces embody a spiritual quality that sharply contrasts old beliefs with those of the modern world. The pins, these are called animal pins, themselves harken back to a ceremonial seed planter and other effigies to celebrate the natural world in places worldwide. Interested in Jungian psychology and the idea of psychic unity or a collective unconscious that ties a common thread through all of our existence, no matter where or when we've lived. He's attentive to the spiritual religious significance of nature in early civilizations. Morris rethinks how our ancestors have used certain symbolic depictions of animals, oftentimes elevating them as divine or sacred. So these are hot glass sculpted. And um, you guys have all seen the, that red tail hawk that we have in the collection by Jane Rosen. She worked in his uh, glass studio to make those. So all those glass people are all connected because you have to have so many people involved. <laughs> Just as a lot of the early bronze people all worked in each other's in studios. Uh, Lanford Monroe uh, is an artist that we have in our collection. Um, and I can't remember. Five paintings are in the collection. Um, she was grew up surrounded by art. Her parents were illustrator and portraitists. Her neighbors were John Clymer and Bob Kuhn. Uh, she created moody landscapes, often occupied by wildlife. Uh, and many felt that Monroe was at the peak of her artistic powers when she passed away at age 50 from a heart attack in the year 2000. Uh, she was in Western Visions uh, many times, um, and her husband Chip had, has had this um, in his house above his fireplace for many years and just contacted the museum to see if we were interested in acquiring it. Um, so Adam said, Are, is that the same moose just in a bunch of different positions in this painting? And, and uh, Chip said no. Um, and so they, Chip and Lanford were driving through Yellowstone um, and they saw a huge moose jam, um, and he and Lanford waited until people had all gone away and the moose had disappeared uh, into the woods, um, and they followed the moose's path uh, a few hundred feet off the road, and they witnessed this incredible gathering of moose um, alone, with, uh, alone here in the woods. Uh, and later, Lanford made various paintings of the scene and when Chip saw them in her studio, he said they would be a really good diptych. Um, so uh, Lanford died in 2000, uh, the same year that this painting was created. Um, and they saw the moose in 98 or 99, one of, uh, right after one of her last visits to the museum. Wendy Maruyama, which I keep messing up her name, so I apologize, Wendy. Wendy is a San Diego artist. Uh, she was trained as a furniture maker. She's also an educator and an artist. She was one of the first women, two women to graduate with a master's in furniture making from Rochester Institute of Technology. She is in permanent museum collections, including the Victorian Albert Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the LA County Museum of Art, the Mint Museum, and the Oakland Museum of Art. He's won several prestigious awards, the California Civil Liberties Public Education Grant, National Endowment for the Arts Grant for Visual Artists, uh, the Japan U.S. Fellowship, and a Fulbright um, Research Grant. Her work uh, is about ideas of feminism and traditional craft objects, and then moves beyond the boundaries of traditional studio craft into the realm of social practice. So this piece is part of a larger 
a series called The Wildlife Project, which focuses on the endangerment of elephants. So, um, globally, thousands of wild animals are still forced to perform demeaning and unnatural tricks to entertain the public. They are exploited in traveling circuses, sideshows, and within zoos, and used in advertising, film, and television. This piece is uh, called Homage to Tyke, and Tyke was a circus elephant um, that had been abused and made to perform. So originally, as you guys know, zoos were private collections of animals, and animals were often hunted or made to fight and perform. That still happens today. And this work can help us to examine our relationship to the natural world and wild beings and to tell the story of animals in captivity, performing and making people aware of this interaction. Yes. Yeah. Yes, she's Asian American. It's wood, um, and it's painted wood, and it is all faceted, so it actually folds in half when we, when we got it. We had to unfold it and stick it on the wall. So it's, yeah, it's wood, so it's kind of tying into her furniture background. Um, so, yeah. It's part of a project. This one is sort of its own little thing, but it's part of a larger series that she's done of animal masks, of elephant masks. Um, so large. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, she is an English artist. She studied at the Chelsea School of Art um, and finished postgraduate work at the Royal College of Art. She was awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire for her contribution to the visual arts. Her primary media are plaster and straw, as well as huge sheets of brown paper with charcoal drawings. She often depicts figures from mythology and literature. This is called Untitled Bear Lying Down. Um, and she is totally obsessed with bears, but, and has never seen one in the wild. Bears have been extinct in Britain for centuries, and she spends a lot of time at a bear sanctuary outside of London. And this bear was once a circus bear, and this is a drawing of him lying on his back in that sanctuary. So, an interesting tie to the circus elephant and the sanctuary where the bears can go have a bear life. Um, we also have a piece in uh, the Gilcrease that is a uh, Bohemian Bear Tamer. So that also really ties in, and the Tower of London. All of these things tie into that sort of history of us keeping animals and using them for entertainment and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. training them. Um, so her quote about this is, the image and character of the bear have been an essential element in the lexicon of my imagination all my life. Early memories of learning slowly to read with Maurice Sendak's Little Bear. That's where this guy came from. I don't know if you guys read those books. That's how so I learned to read. <laughs> um, uh, bowling along and with Paddington pulled up by Ted Hughes's poem Bear. My first independent conviction that it is wicked to cage sentient beings uh, dawned looking into the eyes of a slumped bear in a zoo. Uh, from bear hug to sore heads, I adore the bear. He seems to revel in his strength and his senses. I visit bears in a nearby wildlife park often and watch endless documentaries, but to my great frustration, she com she's come here a couple times and never been able to see a bear. Has yet, <laughs> has, has yet failed to see a wild bear in his habitat. Sporadic attempts have come to nothing. So, so now, imagine that you guys are all voting. Yeah. Um, does anybody know what happened last night? Don't tell. And Jane does. <laughs> so the first vote. Do you guys want to vote or do you want me sure, to tell you? Sure. sure. All right. Who, let's see. How are we going to do this? Um, the first round of voting last night voted to conserve this painting. Oh, that's good. So. Then, the second round of voting, then we had, I don't know, a bunch of money left. Second round of voting voted for the elephant mask, oh. which is, was pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, am I right? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think I am. Okay, the third round.
round of voting, I might be making some of this up, Jane might be able to remind me, was a tie. So then when it's a tie, we have to do another round that breaks the tie. So you're only allowed to vote for one of the two that tied. So, am I right, Jane? Elephant head went second? Okay, then the tie was between this piece and the glass pins. I know, that's what's so fascinating. You would, if you were here, you would vote a different way. The pins won that round. So then we have wolf conserved, elephant mask, glass pins. So then, no, then it goes back to the big pot. Then everyone voted for the Coonert. I think. <laughs> Pretty sure. So then, uh, we had a certain amount left and everyone voted and we got this, this piece. Then, this is what happens sometimes, there's always somebody who brings up, well, we don't want any of these other pieces, we don't really like them, let's just bank the money for next year. And so, and they've, every single year people bring it up. And it never happens. <laughs> and last night it happened. It did. Oh. And so we have a chunk of money in the bank for next year. But then, after that, there are some people that are like, I wanted that piece that I loved, that I loved. So two people, two different anonymous parties, gifted, purchased themselves, and then gifted to the museum, the Lanford Monroe and the bear drawing. So the only thing we didn't collect was the ceramic piece, which is a pretty good record. So, so that's what happened. You didn't collect. Yes, we did. Jane? Oh, you mean just the remainder yeah, of the money? Table mm. anyway, the conversation. It wasn't that they didn't like the remaining pieces. Yeah. But they were very interested in having a bigger till next year because they wanted to have something big, big, yeah. big, like something, they, the, what they said was something maybe 200, worth 200,000, yeah. maybe a new piece of the sculpture girl. They were thinking cool. big. Cool. That's fun. So it was more about that than about not liking it. Right. Okay, good. Thank you. I misunderstood you and I thought that they had said, no, let's just take all our money and save it for no. next year. Yes. Was the jury Everybody that came to dinner, 60 plus people, all voted. And do you know what the break down No idea what, no. That is a good question. Is there a graph? This way? Let's get some I hope so. I want it to. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry if I missed it at the beginning, no. but other than the Lindbergh and Rao, how do you pick the other ones that are even brought to the table? So, um, Adam and I are constantly looking at art, and people are constantly sending us art, and we're, we're just trolling everywhere. We're reading things, we're looking at things, we're looking at auctions, we're looking at gallery exhibits, we're, we have like weird, crazy bank of things that are in our head, and then we... And we have uh, galleries that we have relationships with, so, um, and then we see what's available at the time, and then we see what people could actually send to us that we could have in the building, because you need to see the real thing instead of the picture. So then we go through a bunch of months of showing work to the collections committee, and them voting, and us telling them why we think it's important and why it should be in the collection. And then we have a final, a final vote, and then a second final vote, and then we see if the work is still available or, or sold or not, and then it, and then we bring it here. So and then it's been vet, so it's been vetted by the collections committee and us. Who who is the collection? It is a board, a board committee, just like the development committee or the um, all the other ones. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, the age of the people that go, they're old. They're older, older members because of people our. Were, I mean, all many of us went to that to the deer. I mean, we had eight or nine people there compared to all the rest of us, and the deer didn't even get a, a bunch. I know. Well, I think the deer was very close in that last save the money or get it. Wow. That's yeah. I think it's interesting too. For me, it, that it's really fun to just be able to get contemporary ceramics in front of people and have it 
considered because ceramics, there are a lot of, just like the argument with photography that people still like to bring up, which is wrong, is photography art. The same thing is about things that are made with traditionally craft uh, mediums. So it's really fun to be able to even show somebody ceramics and say, look, this is art too, even though you might think that ceramics is usually used as a functional thing. So, But they picked the elephant. Yeah. Yes, they did. So that's great. <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions?